Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Maruba Baptist Church. Please come in, find a seat, um, but stand with us this morning. We're going to start our service off with singing praise to our Heavenly Father.
awake at the sound of Jesus' name. A love's made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Chains will fall. Jesus said, For God loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is what we believe. Um, and because of this great act of love, we have freedom through Jesus Christ. Um, and this is the good news story that we need to share with future generations. And so as we sing now, we're going to sing a new song. Um, but I encourage you to reflect on everything that God's done in your life and how you can share that with others. See you 
everyone and welcome to Maroubra Baptist Church. It's great to see you all here in person today and a big hello to those of you watching online at home or anywhere in the world. Happy birthday to you! <laughs> Eric, you've turned 80 this week. Yes, I eventually found out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's been a few little celebrations during the week. Eric, um, we love you and we know you've been in this church from the time you're a small child. Tell us, what is your favourite thing about Maroubra Baptist Church? The favourite thing is the uh, faithful presentation of the word and the fellowship, the community around uh, uh, Christian things and values and all the good times we've had as a, uh, young people growing up and the church and then... Uh, learning about uh, the Lord through reading the scripture and um, studying his word so that we get values in life. That was the, one of the big factors in my life, learning what right and wrong was and values. Yeah, and you definitely have seen a lot of people grow up in the church. Mm. Um, is there anything that you can say that you've learned as in your life as time's gone by? Yeah, just something you can offer to younger Christians? Mm. Get wisdom. That was the wisest man in, in uh, Christendom said uh, the chief thing is to get wisdom and uh, the beginning of wisdom is, is the fear of the Lord. Once we know uh, who we're dealing with and we uh, take notice of what he's said in his word, he's given us some real values um, and uh, understanding of right and wrong and uh, how to succeed in life what to do, what not to do, etc. And do you feel 80? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that we spoke about this week in the kitchen at playtime, um, Jenny Wang was actually speaking about it and we were saying Jenny looked young. Yes. You and know. that is to have a positive attitude. Correct, yeah. Um, and to be grateful for God for the good things and focus that's, on the good things in your life? That's very true, Megan, very true. Yeah. Uh, because uh, we can't change what's happened in life, but we can, can adapt our or change our attitude to, to what's happened. And we can uh, rejoice uh, at all the blessings that the Lord has provided and uh, the wonderful things that he's helped us do and learn and grow and develop over the years. And uh, that lovely fellowship in the church. And it was a great time growing up as a young person here, um, just over 70 odd years ago. <laughs> you know, well said Eric, and we can see that in you. You really do um, have an attitude of gratitude. 
Mm. So yeah, thank you yeah. for being here today. And I won't sing again, but a very, very happy <laughs> birthday yeah. from all of us to you. Thank you very much. Oopsie, that might be someone ringing to say happy birthday. <laughs> this week, we have some very special news and we're pleased to announce that D Diaconate has appointed Chris Chow as our office administrator. We're grateful to God for um, bringing that into her heart and we, she'll be taking on that role two days a week and there'll be a handover period bet with Dawn between now and when Dawn leaves. Thank you, Dawn, for that. She's done a wonderful job, Dawn, hasn't she? She has. Very faithful and efficient administrator. Another thing that we're very grateful mm. for. So, here we are. Let's join together to worship God and have our Sunday service. See ya. Bye. We can't forget you. You're 18 and we want to wish you a very a happy, happy birthday. birthday. <laughs>
and find somewhere safe to live, sleep, eat and bring up children. We realise this can perpetrate ongoing problems for the future unless powerfully dealt with by a masterful problem solver. Lord, please have mercy. Forgive our willful, willful rebellion and raise up strong, capable leaders who can facilitate ways out of this mess and not prolong or exacerbate it. Cambodia also comes to mind and we thank you for all the missionaries and aid workers amongst the Khmer people, providing them with the necessary education, medical relief and means of self-sufficiency. We also think of Sam and pray for his ministry in Nigeria and his family here at home. We also think of our young people as they navigate life in the process of becoming responsible adults. Please help them to do well in exams and their choices of careers and relationships and particularly partners later on maybe. Keep them safe in mind, body and spirit so that they in turn successfully pass on the mantle to the next generation. Give them the joy of knowing and growing in your kingdom as we all must do. Minister to those who are sick, suffering, bereaved, lonely or battling with difficulties in life or relationships as only you can do once again, enabling resolution to their situation or of their situation. May we all be loving and caring for those round about us and further afield too. Lord, please help us all be wise with our finances and good things in life that you have graciously bestowed on us, that we may be generous and caring for others less fortunate or in need. In other words, help us to be outward looking rather than preoccupied pied with self only. May our, may our offerings be more than just a token of our love for you. Multiply what is given to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think so that your kingdom can be greatly extended both here and abroad. Thank you, Lord, that we can be part of your plan from creation to consummation as per your word. We praise the one who has made all things possible in Jesus' almighty name. Amen. Eric's just uh, prayed about it, <clears throat> we're now going to do it, which is to give. Uh, we're going to worship as we do that, the team will be coming up, and as is our custom, we have an opportunity to worship God through our song and, and our heart, uh, and our gifts that we give back to him. Uh, so with a generous heart and a sense of trust in what God is doing, let's give and respond to him. You'll see the QR code for those uh, online. You can use that for those here. You can use that now as well, or there is the offering box at, at the back that you can place a gift in. So would you stand and prepare our hearts for worshiping God and for giving, uh, worshiping through our giving? So let's uh, let's bless the Lord. Bye-bye. 
the reading is from Psalm 73, verses 1 to 14. God is indeed good to Israel, to the pure in heart. But as for me, my feet almost slipped, my steps nearly went astray. For I envied the arrogant, I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have an easy time until they die, and their bodies are well fed. They are not in trouble like others. They are not afflicted like most people. Therefore, pride is their necklace, and violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge out from fatness. The imaginations of their hearts run wild. They mock, and they speak maliciously. They arrogantly threaten oppression. They set their mouths against heaven, and their tongues strut across the earth. Therefore, his people turn to them and drink in their overflowing words. The wicked say, how can God know? Does the Most High know everything? Look at them, the wicked. They are always at ease, and they increase their wealth. Did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? For I am afflicted all day long and punished every morning. Now, I'm not going to name any names this morning. But in the course of my life, I've, em I've envied several people because they didn't know the Lord. They didn't have to do the things I had to do because of church commitments. And they got to do all the things I wanted to do but couldn't because it wasn't in line with my Christian family ethic. As a young kid, I hung out with mates and they were allowed to watch things on VHS videotapes and stuff like that that I just wasn't allowed to watch. Wasn't considered wholesome in my house. Revenge of the Nerds, Police Academy, Porkies, Nightmare on Elm Street, and so on. I had friends that were allowed to swear, even in front of their parents. In fact, their parents swore too and smoked in the house. Why couldn't I have cool parents like that? I had friends that didn't have to go to church on Sunday. They were allowed to play sport. All the rugby league happened on a Sunday. My mates played. They could go surfing on a Sunday. Sunday for them was a free day. They had so much fun swearing and smoking on the sidelines of those fields, I'm sure. I can only imagine. Well, I was stuck here with oldies singing hymns. As I grew up, my mates living godless lives had more advantages and more freedoms that I didn't have. Girlfriends slept over at their house with their parents' home. They didn't care. They didn't see a problem with that. I had a friend in high school whose mum would let us party there every Friday night. Kids in the neighbourhood would come from around the beach, Severn Street, and we'd be allowed to drink and smoke after a long, hard week of Year 10. <laughs> Don't blame my parents for that. That's on me. They had no idea the deception they were dealt. I wasn't good, but I was damn good at it. As I moved through life, I had this inconvenient conviction born out of this mix of my Christian upbringing and what I now know to be the whispers of the Holy Spirit, even though I told him, get lost. That meant I didn't really have the freedom to enjoy my rebellion 
the way my mates seem to sell their souls into it with a grin. Although I didn't bow to God, I knew him. I knew he knew me and what I was up to and that was a weight on my wayward heart. A weight I didn't even know existed fully until I didn't have it. But I envied my mates who took advantage of our misadventure with peace of mind. I came to know in time that peace is a spiritual slumber which has given me a whole new perspective on the term woke. I know what it is to truly be woke from that slumber. As a teenage surfer in Maruba in the 90s, there was a celebrated violence and rebellion that would get you street cred if you could be so hard. Chicks dig it. Plenty of chicks. Rough nut waxed heads with glamours on their arm. Able to do whatever they wanted with them. The boys were having a good time wearing pride like a necklace and violence like a garment. After I received Jesus as my Lord and Saviour at the age of 25 in Dubai, it was clear the life I'd been living had to change. And it did change. And boy, did it challenge every fibre of my being. As I put one foot in front of the other in my new walk with God, he empowered me to do that. I couldn't have done that. His grace was sufficient and his spirit was supreme. But, as for me, my feet almost slipped. I nearly went astray. I'd begun living in a new way that was opposite to many of my mates, all of my mates, and it was hard. They seem to have this carefree enjoyment of the debaucherous opportunities of that opulent lifestyle in Dubai. Man, of all the places to be saved 20 years ago, Dubai? It was like a rock star lifestyle. It was like loading up a hedonistic plate at a proverbial seafood buffet. Every delight, everything you want, whatever it is. If it looks good, if it tastes good, if it feels good, take it. It's there, free, have it. It's yours. Have more. There's plenty here. Fill that plate. Those initial days of my discipleship in Dubai gave me a sense that I was loading up that plate of life, debaucherous delicacies, and had been, as my mouth watered, as much as life could offer, only to be told by God to leave your plate on the counter and go back to your table over there and eat your dinner roll with no butter. I had the desires of the flesh laid on in Dubai. And might I add, they were laid on in a very specific and special way by my enemy the moment I decided not to feast on them. But I was called to leave my plate in that buffet of debauchery and commit to a diet of faith in God that held absolutely no tangible advantage to my flesh. No advantage to the world around me, enjoying what I was no longer enjoying. I eventually came to realise something very important, that if given enough time, seafood rots. And that table I was now sitting at, I was not alone. It was prepared for me by God in the presence of my enemies. And that dinner roll of mine, not leftovers, the bread of life, 
It's the word of God. The ever satisfying meal. We're in Psalm 73 this morning. This psalm not written by David. This psalm written by a man named Asaph. Who's Asaph? He's a worship leader. A worship leader of music in the reigns of King David and his son King Solomon of Israel. He's one of David's three musicians along with Heman and Ethan. We read in 1 Chronicles that David appointed some of the Levites to be ministers before the Ark of the Lord to celebrate the Lord God of Israel and to give thanks and praise to him. Asaph was the chief and Zechariah was second to him. It was this worship leader, Asaph, who gave us this psalm, 73. Ironically, not a song, what we might call a wisdom poem. This psalm shows a man struggling with that question I think we've all struggled with at some point in our life, and that is, why do the wicked seem to prosper? It's so easy for the wicked, the rebels, that enjoy their life while at the same time, in the same world, bad things are happening to good people. God's people. I mean, come on. What's that all about? That's Asaph's struggle. I'm sure it's been ours at one point or another. Asaph comes to a resolution in this struggle. I think we'll be helped by considering his journey, but he gives us his resolution to this struggle in the very first verse of this psalm. Look at it, verse 1. God is indeed good to Israel, to the pure in heart. That's where he lands. God is good to Israel. And we might say God is good to the church who is the true Israel. God is good to his people, that means. The pure in heart. These are those who aren't the fake. The ones that put on a good show. These are those who worship in spirit and in truth. Not all Israel was Israel. And I think we might find not all the church is the church. There are some in the ranks of God's people who are actually far from him in the heart. We don't know who they are necessarily, but God knows. And furthermore, God is good to the pure of heart. Paul would later write in Romans 8.28 that we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Asaph was one of them. But what he will share with us in the remaining 27 verses of this psalm will show us just how perilous his journey to that resolution was. He tells us in verse 2, but as for me, my feet almost slipped My steps nearly went astray. He feels like he didn't make it almost. This man's a worship leader. He nearly slipped and went astray. Why? What was it that nearly made this accomplished worship leader nearly go astray? Verse 3. For I envied the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have an easy time until they die. Their bodies are well fed. They're not in trouble like others. They're not afflicted like most people. Therefore, pride is their necklace and violence covers them like a garment. 
Their eyes bulge out from fatness. The imaginations of their hearts run wild. And they can act on them, no doubt. They mock and they speak maliciously. They arrogantly threaten oppression. This was Asaph's observation. This was my observation, as I've just shared, at points in my life. And may I point out that both Asaph's and my observation predate social media. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok. These platforms are full to the brim showcasing the prosperity of the wicked. The arrogant, the well-fed, the proud, the violent, the malicious, mockers of many kinds, and of course those hiding under the thin veil of virtue called the influencers, only wanting to influence us for our betterment, of course. Nothing in it for them. They just care so much. Now, this is not to beat up social media because that's just a platform which gives full expression to human nature. That's a platform that's given great expression to our new nature too, hasn't it? The Bible's gone out on it. Jesus is declared on it. It's great. But if Asaph struggled with the prosperity of the wicked and the oppression of the righteous in what he witnessed in the world, how much do we witness in the world wide web? Money, sex, beauty, power. Money, sex, beauty, power. Money, sex, beauty, power. Prosperity. That's what. Jesus, sin, repent, salvation. Jesus, sin, repent, salvation. Jesus, sin, repent, salvation, oppression. How does that make sense? When we observe the ways of this world, we can struggle with a perception of injustice easily, can't we? Asaph has said in Psalm 73, Amen to that. That's his struggle. But the journey's not complete yet. These godless oppressors now, if it wasn't bad enough, are now going to, verse 9, set their mouths against heaven. Their tongues strut across the earth in front of the word. Therefore his people turn to them and drink in their overflowing words. The wicked say, how can God know? Does the Most High know everything? Implication proven. Look at them, the wicked. They are always at ease and they increase in wealth. The psalmist observed here that the wicked put contempt upon God himself, bidding defiance, challenging his complete sovereignty, his complete knowledge, all while living with ease, all while increasing in wealth and enjoyment. You're crazy if you don't get on this bus. Notice these people are challenging God's knowledge of their actions and or his power to do anything about it. But notice, they're challenging God, which means they're at least acknowledging God. How far have we evolved in our arrogance to dismiss him from creation altogether? Wow. Remember the psalmist here has begun to stray. He's envious of these people. That's what it looks like to stray from the Lord, to be envious of people who don't know him. We have to watch out. He's envious, and that appears to have caused a blindness to reality. 
because, you know, not even the wealthy can escape all of life's problems now, can they? And we should not be deceived as we gaze upon the world to think so, like Asaph. Verse 13, he says, Did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? What's your discipleship been for? For I am afflicted all day long and punished every morning. Now here shows his honour. If I had decided to say these things aloud, I would have betrayed your people. When I tried to understand all this, it seemed hopeless. We know Asaph was struggling with the actions of the wicked and perhaps the inaction of God, right? Asaph himself had done all the right things, pure heart, cleaned hands, and yet, in his words, being punished every day for it. That's what Asaph thought. But it's not what Asaph said now, is it? That's honourable. That's mature. That's a great example. Because he knew that in his position, he's a worship leader. He's calling people to worship the Lord. He's a follower of God. People look to him and say, that's what it's like to follow God. His condition is God's character. He knew that even in his struggle. He knew that he would betray God's people if he were to give a voice to such an evil thought which he'd conceived of, and that is there's no point living for God. Living for God is in vain. What could be more damaging to the next generation than that declaration? What if our Sunday school teachers were to say that to our kids? Lost. That we'd be better off abandoning God's will because there's no reward for faith. There's no justice in his world. There's nothing more misleading or more damaging sometimes than giving consent to our criticism of God through our testimony of his failing. We can feel it, but we should be careful about how we say it. Asaph knew that, and he honourably kept his error to himself and he tried to understand it. Now, if you feel that way, I'm not saying you can't share it. You just shouldn't proclaim it. And you should share it with someone that you know is in touch with the Lord and the Lord can counsel you through in the presence of the Holy Spirit. So please don't hear me say, keep your doubts to yourself. <laughs> no. Honour the Lord with our lips. Asaph knew it and so he honourably kept it to himself and tried to understand it. But verse 16, it seemed hopeless. It was hopeless. There was no evidence of justice as far as he could see. There was no sense in the ways of the world. Absolutely hopeless. Absolutely unjust. But, until, until, this is a word that is, this whole psalm is about to hinge upon. Until. It's the turning point in his understanding. It's the turning point in any understanding of this dilemma. It's a moment of truth, verse 17. Until I entered God's sanctuary, then I understood their destiny. Changes everything. The confusion and turmoil in Asaph's heart was settled in the sanctuary of God. 
Where do we expect we might find meaning in this crazy world? If not the sanctuary of God. Asaph, no doubt, retreated to the temple. That was the practice in those days to seek the oracle of the Lord, which was through the priest speaking, shedding light on your dark scenario, the ones difficult to understand. He went to the sanctuary, the temple, to seek the priest, and there he came to understand the destiny of the wicked. And that changed everything. How can you envy the plight of the wicked when you know the destiny? He understood their bright morning would be followed by a dark evening and an eternally dark night. Verse 18, Indeed, you put them in slippery places. They seem so healthy. They seem so wealthy. They seem so sure and strong and powerful. Hang on. Indeed, you put them, they are in slippery places. You make them fall into ruin. And how suddenly they become a desolation. They come to an end, swept away by terrors. Like one waking from a dream. Lord, when arising, you will despise their image. Right now, the prosperity and the success of the wicked has no more reality than a dream. When they awake, they will see Jesus. Hopefully with enough time to repent. Hopefully with a day of salvation remaining. And today is the day of salvation. But they will know either then or when they stand judgment. And it will be clear that far from being apathetic and disengaged and impotent, God will despise their image and judge accordingly. Friends, there is nothing to envy in the prosperity of the wicked. Let's not take that bait. Verse 21. When I became embittered and my inmost being was wounded, I was stupid and didn't understand. I was an unthinking animal toward you. Asaph now, he was now the true definition of woke. He had woken up to himself he had woken up to the deception of what this world has to offer and suddenly saw how stupid he was, saw he was an unthinking animal. You know, my father-in-law tells me of the time when he worked in the abattoir in New Zealand and he used to talk about how they would bring these sheep to slaughter and they would run them up in between those, they'd be like these channels, right, from the pen, they'd have a channel and they'd get this sheep, this one true, this influencer, um, the sheep that every sheep would follow in that pen and they'd get that sheep to walk up that alley and just at a certain point before they went down a slide into the abattoir to be slaughtered, that sheep would veer off onto another lane and quickly a door would shut and those sheep that were following the head sheep were beyond the point of return and they were pushed down to be slaughtered. With a glint in his eye, Wurzo, my father-in-law, would always remind me the name of that sheep because he, <laughs> he just loved to remind me of any attachment to the Bible. He said that sheep's name was Judas. That's the Judas sheep. Because he would betray. He would betray those unthinking animals toward their destruction. Let's be like awakened 
pastor and not blinded Asa, who in his words was an unthinking animal. Verse 23. Yet I am always with you. The blinds are off, he sees the light. Yet I am always with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel and afterward you will take me up in glory. Who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Those far from you will certainly perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, God's presence is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, so I can tell about all you do. Asaph lived about a thousand years before Jesus Christ. And yet, Asaph knew all he needed to know. He knew God. But how much more do we know? We know Jesus. He's always holding us. Guided by the counsel of the Holy Spirit in accordance with the word of God, Jesus is the word. Who do we have in heaven but Jesus? We see him, we know him. He's at the right hand of the Father right now, interceding for us, preparing a place for us. He's in heaven. We have to know that the pleasure and riches that he has in store for us will not perish, will not fade, and will increasingly delight us forever and ever. And he is that treasure. The essence of heaven is Jesus. If we want the pleasure and not him, we won't have him or the pleasure. We've become the sanctuary of the living God by the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. We are the church. He is our refuge. He is our portion. He is our prosperity, our success, our comfort for the same purpose. He was those things for Asaph. Verse 28, he was those things. So, so, here's why he is those things. So, we can tell you about all he does. We can tell the world. We can be witnesses. And the best way we can tell the world of the treasure we've found is to treasure the gift we've been given. Praise his name forever and ever. Amen. And we, the church, with Asaph, can return now to the opening resolution of verse 1. God is good to his people. That's us. And we who do not know Jesus as Lord and Saviour, and either enjoy or envy the prosperity of the wicked, the world that doesn't know God, I pray that we will awaken to that truth. That we'll stop following the Judas sheep unto destruction and begin to follow the Lamb of God to life. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your revelation to Asaph. Thank you so much for choosing him and anointing him to pour out his heart like he has, to take him on that journey, to bring him full swing by your revelation, even despite the deception of the prosperity of the wicked, the world without you. Heavenly Father, you've given us that same clarity. You've opened the eyes of the hearts of many in this room. I pray that you would open every heart in this room and online watching now, Lord, that they would come, that we would stand in awe of you, this gift, this treasure, this eternal pleasure that will never spoil, never fade, never rust, never be stolen, and it's ours in Jesus Christ. Let all else fade away. There is nothing, there is nothing this world can offer us that we don't have in Jesus Christ, our treasure forever. Help us to follow him, no turning back. 
by your grace and to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and we'll sing some more. Don't turn it. 
It's been great to spend some time in the Psalms, hasn't it? We're going to continue that for the next couple of weeks. Uh, next week, we're going to look at a lament. And that's going to take us from this sort of psalm where Asaph looked at the world and thought, what's going on? They're doing great and I'm not. But then his perspective changed as he looked back to God. I love that changing point. You know, I, I went to the sanctuary and saw God. Affirmed of what is true. Well, next week, we're going to look at a psalm when people say, I don't even know what God's doing. Is he even here? So we're going into a new area next week. Really important to see the honesty of the psalmist again. You want to have a sneak peek? Psalm 13. Uh, jump into that. Uh, coffee and tea are here. Uh, it's great to be together. Uh, for those online, sorry, make your own at home. Um, but great part of being here together. Uh, coffee and tea is here. And we have a cake, uh, which is coming down uh, for the the one who said uh, <laughs> something's going on this week, I think. So I, I, I do think we need to uh, sing. Darren said we have to, uh, so we have to. So, you know, you're better at this than me. So lead us in a, lead us in a happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Eric. Happy birthday to you. Hip, hip. Hip, hip. Hip, hip.